The following program is furnished by the Truth About Your Future, LLC. The views expressed do not necessarily reflect the views of this station. This information is education and not financial advice. Sponsors of the program pay a fee to be interviewed. See the TruthAYF.com disclosure page for details. Consult a financial advisor before investing. The Truth About Your Future with Rick Edelman is brought to you by Global X ETFs, dedicated to providing investors with unexplored and intelligent solutions. And by Bitwise, a trusted guide in crypto has never mattered more. Connect with their dedicated team of crypto experts nationwide at bitwiseinvestments.com. And by Invesco QQQ, a fund that allows you to access the innovators of the NASDAQ 100, Invesco.com. And by Edelman Financial Engines. Rick Edelman is a board member, consultant, shareholder, and client of EFE. But EFE is unaffiliated and has no say over the content of the truth about your future with Rick Edelman. This is where technology, innovation, and personal finance come together. This is the truth about your future with Rick Edelman. And now your host, Rick Edelman. Thanks for joining me this holiday season. Happy Hanukkah to you. And coming up on today's show, the problem with adjustable rate mortgages. Amazing advances in healthcare management. The advantages of REITs, real estate investment trusts, living healthy at age 100. And I'll tell you about my new weekday podcast. It begins January 3rd. Plus, my wife Jean with her word of the week. And if you have an adjustable rate mortgage, your future may not be as bright after the Fed's rate hike this week. You've been trying to buy a house lately. That means you're probably trying to qualify for a mortgage. And you've seen that mortgage rates are pushing 7%. And this is why borrowers are now turning to arms. When's the last time you heard that in the mortgage industry? Adjustable rate mortgages. This is where the uh, typical rate, instead of 7%, right now it's about 49 it has a lower rate for the first five years, but then it's variable after that. The last time the, if we looked at this, it was years before people were interested in adjustable mortgages because a year ago, fixed rate mortgages were 2.8. Who needed to get an adjustable mortgage when you could get a fixed rate at below three? Well, look at what's going on these days because of the increase in interest rates. The monthly payment on a $300,000 mortgage, 30-year fixed, it's like 1200 bucks if the interest rate is only 3%. But if the interest rate is 6, it's 1800 bucks. That's 600 hours more per month. That's a huge problem. A 44% increase in your monthly payment compared to a year ago. And that's assuming the price of the house didn't go up. And we know that they did. Over the past year, home prices skyrocketed. The median price of new homes these days over $400,000. Housing affordability is now at the lowest level since 1989. So people struggling to buy homes are increasingly turning to arms, adjustable rate mortgages, because they can't afford the fixed rate. And that's the problem. Because if you go to an adjustable rate mortgage, what happens as interest rates continue to rise in the economy? That means you could be hit suddenly with a sharply increased mortgage payment in five years. And if you can't afford it, you'll be forced to sell the house. But to who? Because nobody else will be able to afford it either. That could cause the price of the house to go down. You could end up being upside down on the mortgage, owing more to the lender than what the house is worth. We saw this happen rampantly in 2008. And you want to make sure you don't put yourself in that position. Here's the bottom line. If you can't afford the monthly payment on a fixed rate mortgage, you can't afford to buy the house. It's really that simple. You need to keep renting. I'm sorry to tell it to you this way, but it's the way that it is. If you go with an adjustable rate mortgage, you are taking a very, very big financial risk. Do not do an adjustable rate mortgage. Go with a 30-year fixed rate loan, and if the only way to make that affordable is to buy a cheaper home, then so be it. Otherwise, your future will be filled with stress and regret. And I want you to avoid that truth about your future. If you're listening to the truth about your future. Let me ask you a question. Are you a millionaire? Well, you might not be, but you very well may be pretty soon. Credit Suisse says there are 63 million millionaires in the world. And that number is going to rise 40% in just the next four years. We're going to have 88 million millionaires in the short-term future. If you're not going to be one of them, 
I want to know why. It might be because you're doing something wrong. You're not managing your money correctly. You're not earning enough money. You're not saving enough money. You're not saving it in the right places. With a 40% increase in the number of millionaires on the uh, worldwide basis, there's really not a lot of excuses for you not to be one of them. So now's the time to take advantage of that opportunity, despite everything going on in the world. In fact, even particularly because of everything going on in the world, prices are down, and that means buying opportunities abound. When prices recover, wealth is going to get created. Now's your chance to be on that list of millionaires to be over the next four years. In fact, there are some folks who are already millionaires and they're going to be piling on their profits at Oracle Corporation. Their top executives are among the highest paid of all U.S. companies. Larry Ellison is chair of Oracle and Safra Katz is CEO. Each one of them were paid more than $138 million in the last 12 months. And guess what? They're ranked only fourth and fifth in income among Fortune 500 CEOs. So this is the thing. The excitement is a lot of folks who are not yet millionaires can become millionaires, but we know in the middle of the, all this, a lot of Americans remain struggling to pay their bills on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. In the middle of all that, we've got individuals who are making $138 million in a single year. The rich are getting richer, the poor are staying poor, and this is going to exacerbate the political fight between the haves and the have-nots. I hope that during this fight, you're at least among those who are finding themselves in the situation of being a millionaire or on the road to becoming one. It'll help make the fight a little bit easier for you. I'm Rick Edelman. This is The Truth About Your Future. You're listening to The Truth About Your Future, and one of the most important elements of our future drinking water. We know that by 2030, we're going to have half as much drinking water around the world as we will need to feed uh, all of our livestock as well as all of our people. This is a real problem. And fortunately, there is some effort underway to improve the situation. 64 institutional investors with a combined $10 trillion in assets have now launched the Valuing Water Finance Initiative. It's led by the government of the Netherlands and includes such huge organizations as CalPERS, the California Public Employees Retirement System, along with Australian Super, the uh, Australia's version of retirement programs, the United Kingdom's Environment Agency Pension Fund, the Government Employees Pension Fund of South Africa, New York City Retirement Systems, and others. All of these organizations are working with 72 companies in the food, beverage, apparel, and technology industries. We're talking companies that include McDonald's, Coca-Cola, ConAgra, Adidas, Microsoft, Amazon, and Sony. So we all recognize that we've got a water problem on our planet, and fortunately, there's a lot of attention increasingly being paid to address it. I'm hopeful and a little bit confident that we're going to figure it out so that our future isn't a dry one. It also suggests that there are some really interesting investment opportunities in water. Water technology, water distribution, water collection. This is an area of exponential technology that I'm paying attention to, and perhaps you should too. I'm Rick Edelman. This is The Truth About Your Future. Listening to The Truth About Your Future with Rick Edelman. Thanks for listening to today's show, and thanks to Bitwise Asset Management for being our sponsor. Rick asked Bitwise to support the show because Bitwise has just one mission, to help you understand and access the opportunities in crypto. As crypto continues to grow in scale and complexity, a trusted guide is more important than ever. That's why Bitwise has built a nationwide team of crypto experts to help you. So take advantage of Bitwise's team. They work closely with financial advisors, institutions, and individual investors just like you. Talk to a Bitwise expert today or sharpen your crypto knowledge with Bitwise's awesome library of content. You'll find great help whether you're a crypto beginner or a financial professional. Crypto has major risks to consider, including the loss of your entire investment. So before investing in crypto funds, visit bitwiseinvestments.com for their library of content and to learn about the risks with these investments. That's bitwiseinvestments.com. What do all the greatest innovations have in common? 
Agents of Innovation. Ordinary people who shape the future by putting their money behind the right ideas. Invesco QQQ is a fund that allows you access to innovators of the NASDAQ 100. So you don't have to be an inventor to help create what's next to come. Be an agent of innovation with Invesco QQQ. Learn more at Invesco.com slash QQQ. There are risks when investing in ETFs, including possible loss of money. ETFs' risks are similar to those of stocks. Investments in the tech sector are subject to greater risk and more volatility than more diversified investments. The NASDAQ 100 Index comprises the 100 largest non-financial companies on the NASDAQ. You can't invest directly into an index. Before investing, carefully read and consider fund investment objectives, risks, charges, expenses, and more in the prospectus at Invesco.com. Invesco Distributors, Inc. When your health diagnosis isn't going according to plan, you likely seek a second opinion. It's time you treat your wealth the same way. Get a new perspective, new information, a new diagnosis for your investments. Get a second opinion from a wealth planner at Edelman Financial Engines. Our dedicated planners offer personalized advice and are ready to talk one-on-one. Our approach is backed by institutional rigor. We model over 38,000 securities monthly so we can better stress test your portfolio through thousands of scenarios. So take a deep breath and take care of your wealth like you take care of your health. Get your complimentary wealth checkup today where you can discuss your financial plan with a wealth planner. Call Edelman Financial Engines at 888-899-4450. That's 888-899-4450. Or visit planefe.com slash rick. You're listening to The Truth About Your Future. We talk often about crypto, and when I mention the word crypto, people instantly think of the word Bitcoin. Because Bitcoin is the oldest, the original digital asset, it remains the largest digital asset. And for a lot of folks, the world of crypto is really all about Bitcoin. Even a lot of the people who own Bitcoin don't really fully understand what it is. But here's the point that I want to make to you. As much as there's conversation about Bitcoin, Ethereum, and some other digital assets, they are not the big thing in crypto. The big thing in crypto is tokenization. This is truly revolutionary, and you need to understand what it is, how it works, how it's going to affect your life over the coming decade and more. And to help us explore all this and help you understand it, I'm very happy to bring onto the program John Weiser. He is the co-founder and CEO of Tokenology Labs, which you can find at tokenologylabs.com. John, welcome to the program. Good to have you with us. Thank you for having me here, Rick. So, John, you're very deep into Web3. Um, first of all, let's do a, you know, a reality check. Explain to folks what Web3 is. Web3 uh, is used when talking about the next iteration of the Internet, where what Web 1.0 was read-only and very rudimentary. Web2 introduced a centralized web where people could build businesses and control information and the flow of revenue through it. Web3 is a completely decentralized internet that is more technically equipped to interact with advanced technologies, which include AI, artificial intelligence, ML, machine learning, IoT, the internet of things, blockchain, NFTs, crypto wallets, cryptocurrencies, DeFi, and a lot of other tools to help navigate the digital world. This is all new. All of those words you just cited are uh, jargon. Most folks have no idea what any of that is. It sounds impressive. It sounds complicated. Uh, what, what got you involved in all of this? What were you doing before your deep dive into Web3? Before I was... Uh, part of Tokenology and the team we've built. I was president at Sony Pictures Entertainment. I had run the uh, feature film and television uh, distribution at Sony. 
and president of production for one of the TV units. I was at Sony for 33 years and eight months. And during my last couple of years there, I had been uh, speaking to the studio about the opportunity in Web3 and our opportunity to tokenize content. And after a few conversations uh, and pleading with them, they allowed me to start the first cross-divisional NFT task force, tokenizing content across television, film, and music. And we had formed a cross-divisional team at Sony. And in doing that, uh, we explored many opportunities and had a great deal of learning in that process. And over the course of doing that with Sony and having friends in the space, I was so passionate and lit up about the possibilities of tokenization that I made the very unusual move of turning in my keys at the studio, resigning to go full-time into uh, Web3 and tokenization. That's really noteworthy here, John, because you were one of the leading executives in Hollywood. I mean, your career spans the latest and greatest of television and filmmaking. Talk about the different projects that you were involved in throughout your career at Sony. I had the uh, really the pleasure and responsibility of working with on the uh, film side, representing in the marketplace, the Spider-Man movies, the James Bond movies, uh, and some of the biggest films and some of my favorite films ever from Talladega Nights and Superbad. And uh, we released about 22 new films a year and we managed a library of uh, upwards of 5,000 feature films. On the television side, uh, I represented, this might date myself a little, uh, but uh, Norman Lear and his whole library. I worked for Chuck Barris uh, on the newlywed game, dating game and gong show. Uh, I worked for Peter Goober, who's one of the most prolific executives ever in Hollywood uh, between his Oscars and Emmys. He owns uh, the Dodgers, the Los Angeles Major League Soccer team, the Golden State Warriors and all the stadiums. Uh, and our company got bought out when I was working with Peter by Columbia Pictures. And I went over and in going over there, worked on, again, some of my favorite shows and movies. Uh, the shows include uh, the great uh, Gary Shandling's The Larry Sanders Show. I've represented Seinfeld from day one. Uh, and done pre-production pre coaching on shows like Shark Tank, uh, worked on uh, shows like Wheel of Fortune, Jeopardy, Breaking Bad, and uh, over 350 television series. And in leaving Sony, I was leaving a very well-paid, very highly perked job uh, because I saw the future and I saw myself in it. And I had to pursue that. There was no doubt. I'd lived through the first... Uh, the introduction of the the internet, really. And, and I saw so many opportunities that were worth pursuing there, but I had so much, so many good things going on in my media life uh, that I didn't, I chose not to make the move. But when Web 3.0 came along, it was an undeniable draw to it. Uh, and I pursued my passion. And that really is quite a statement because someone who of your caliber, uh, who's at the top of their game, one of the leading executives in Hollywood, to walk away from that career, not to go into retirement, which is traditionally what I think people would do is just go play golf. You went and created a brand new company focusing on a technology that didn't even exist 10 years ago. So tell us what Tokenology Labs is working on and what you're trying to accomplish. I'm going to uh, change or modify one of your statements that I completely left Hollywood. So what happened was I've got uh, such a good relationship with Sony and with uh, the chairman of television and the chairman of the studio uh, and the film division that uh, when leaving, uh, they didn't really want me to leave. And as part of that, they loaded me up with some world-class IP that I could bring into the Web3 space. And those shows uh, from Sony were and are The Boys, which is the number one show on Amazon, Breaking Bad, Cobra Kai, some of the greatest IP out there. Uh, so when I 
left Sony, I kind of brought some of that Sony with me into the space, which also helped attract other IP. And with that IP, we are making, uh, our strategy is to do NFT drops leading to metaverse games and play to earn games. And in traveling around with that IP, we've met a lot of uh, exciting and very smart people in the space, which led us to what our company's uh, biggest opportunity that we've been working on for about the past 14 months. So talk about an NFT drop. What, is, what does that mean? How does that work? NFT drops for IP are when you create the most important thing in beginning the process of doing NFT drops is really understanding not just the product and the IP you're working with, but understanding the audience and its connection to it. Because it's really all about the fans and how to engage them further in the IP and how to extend and create new fan experiences. So the very first thing you do is, uh, in speaking with the studio, you also work very closely with the showrunners and the writers to understand the characters and where the storyline arcs in the IP are. And with that, you can then create unique assets, which can be characters from the show in the form of avatars or other creative expressions and different assets, be that things that they use in the storyline that you can then bring into Web3. And when you do, when you create these assets, uh, people want to do something with them once they have them. And that's where a metaverse or play to earn game comes in because it allows you to gamify utilizing these assets in ways to create new value and new playtime and new storylines for you to be able to enjoy as a fan. Can you give me a specific example of where you're doing this? We are right now working on the boys drop where we're creating, uh, we're working with the show uh, and with the studio to the development of the different characters, the timing of when the drops will be to coincide with seminal moments from the show when it's on Amazon, and then what eventually the metaverse would look like, meaning are we mirroring assets from the show into the metaverse so it's very familiar, or, or are we creating new fan experiences that don't exist in the show that would be unique to Web3? but it's a lot of planning before you execute. It's a measure twice, cut once, so that you really get it right. And then when you do these drops, meaning the release of the assets, you really have to market and connect to the community in Web3, because Web3 being decentralized, having a community surrounding a project is mission critical and authentic to what Web3 is all about. So you're converting participants. People are able to buy an NFT, a non-fungible token that represents some of their favorite features about the show that they've been enjoying. And by purchasing that NFT, they now have an ownership stake in it. It allows them to get more content, to interact perhaps with the actors or the writers or the directors. Uh, they can use these as they play video games. They can participate in the community of other fans. Uh, so they're actually becoming participants in the project rather than just being a viewer of it, right? Yes, the one thing that separates uh, this type of asset creation and tokenization from most people's experience with entertainment, be it film or television, is there's always, uh, it's a voyeuristic experience when you're watching most content. And in Web3, it can be a participatory experience where people not only participate in playing and uh, with these assets and with their favorite characters and in uh specially created environment, but you can also earn value, make your NFTs more valuable. So in that aspect, they can not only submerge themselves in the content, but be rewarded for doing so. So this is an illustration of the incredible technological development that blockchain is providing. 
And you've got incredible leaders, not just from the crypto community, but from the field of arts uh, and sciences who are recognizing the potential of this tech and applying it into their own businesses. The fact that somebody like John Weiser uh, is taking advantage of this and leading the way in Hollywood is really quite a statement. Uh, John, what would be your advice for people who are thinking about how do they embrace Web3 and blockchain technology? How do they get engaged? What should they do? What advice do you offer for people? Go to YouTube and start watching videos. It's a great low barrier to entry that you could learn at your own pace. And what I find delicious about Web3, which is very different from Hollywood, uh, and I'll start with Hollywood. Hollywood, uh, quite a bit of your value is based on institutional knowledge, the amount of experience you have in the space, the amount of connections, and your knowledge is accrued over a very long period of time, which helps you to continue to optimize what you're doing going forward. Web3, the changes and shifts in the marketplace have been so rapid and distinctive that this is a marketplace that you have tremendous value in, not with institutional knowledge, as much as current knowledge, where the marketplace is today. The marketplace was entirely different six months ago for NFTs as it is today. So someone who takes the time to really read as much as they can and talk with and connect with people in the Web3 space as much as they can, the people that are current are the ones with the great, greatest amount of usable knowledge out there, not necessarily institutional knowledge. And you don't have to fear that you're um, way behind the curve because everybody's way behind the curve. It's an opportunity for you to be cutting edge uh, uh, with this emerging technology. So John, you, you began dealing with NFTs and tokenization from uh, a gaming perspective, an art perspective with television and films. But you quickly realize that tokenization is much more than just games. It can actually fundamentally change and improve businesses and provide real value for people that have nothing to do with gaming. So talk about that. What we experienced was in the NFT art side of the NFT spectrum was that uh, both NFTs and crypto, which are really the first two products off the blockchain. The first product off the blockchain uh, is cryptocurrency. The second product are NFTs, and they have enormous subjective volatility to their valuations. Uh, and that's because they're really based on a pure buy-sell dynamic, not with intrinsic value, but buy-sell dynamics is what drives the economics of those two products. Uh, and what we saw was enormous potential with this technology, but we wanted to decouple ourselves from that subjective volatility. And how we did that was, or how we're doing that, is we started with looking for businesses that were highly addressable markets that we could scale in. And when we looked at different businesses, the real question for us was how could Web3, the technology, advance and add value to a business that currently is broken or under-optimized? And that led us right to healthcare. And in healthcare, we have a broken, non-interoperable system with perverse incentives for companies to work against each other with a lot of money running through the system. And where we saw as the bottleneck where all of the dysfunction in healthcare uh, is best manifested is in the billing where doctors submit claims. I think the number from uh, the health department is that only 2% of medical claims in the United States are filled out and paid correctly. So to us, we saw a 98% improvement uh, possibility for us to get involved with. So we've spent the last 14 months engineering what we believe is the most sophisticated and best in class blockchain tokenization system to improve the process for medical billing. And what that does is 
because we're in medical billing, which is the other end of the pool from NFT art, we went to a mature business with years of historical data of how the performance works and what the revenues are. And we figured out a way to wrap that business in technology to improve it. And with that, we're tokenizing healthcare bills. So when the doctor submits a claim, we improve all the codes on the, on the claim. So the doctor gets a greater return on the claim they're submitting and the patient gets a higher return. We also can speed up the claim time, which today takes anywhere three to six months for a doctor to get their money back. We can adjudicate uh, upwards of 60% of the claim within 48 hours because we have so much data running through our system that through AI and ML, we can accurately predict what a new medical claim will pay, which enables us with the state treasury to be able to adjudicate up to 60% of that claim, which changes doctors' lives in terms of their cash flow. Also, because every medical claim is an NFT, it has intrinsic tradable value, which decouples it from all the subjective volatility valuation with crypto and NFT art. In this, we also have a way uh, through biometric SSID check-in to reduce, drastically reduce all the fraud that goes on in the healthcare system. So for every stakeholder involved, we believe gets a benefit of efficiency, of optimizing the system of more money back and reducing fraud by going after the healthcare system. We partnered with uh, and who are the brains behind the operation to a great degree is MSP, uh, which is Medicaid and Medicare secondary payer created by John Ruiz. Uh, John Ruiz is the biggest collector on behalf of Medicare and Medicaid. And he has uh, partnered with us and committed to our program where he currently has $1.6 trillion in claims under lock and key that we're going to be processing through our NFT platform. We have in the process also partnered with Polygon, specifically Polygon Edge, to run our system on their platform and in working very closely uh, with their engineering team and our brilliant CTO. Uh, we are creating a scalable system that Polygon has not seen the performance of prior to us working with them. Uh, this week, we just were able to mint for each medical claim 25,000 individual NFTs in a minute. And that type of scale, speed, and efficiency will continue to grow because we have bigger plans uh, for the number that we'll be able to mint per minute by the end of the year. So with that, we think we have found a way to create a great deal of trust for Web3, for people trying to enter the space. What they're going to see is a very adult version of Web3 with us helping transform and improve the healthcare business in the United States for doctors, patients, and insurance companies. So for those who think that NFTs, non-fungible tokens, is just about silly pieces of digital art that doesn't have any utility or purpose, you're demonstrating pretty clearly that tokenization can revolutionize commerce in astonishing ways making business operate faster, cheaper, safer, and delivering better results to consumers and better profits simultaneously for businesses. Uh, and at the same time, huge benefits for government, saving taxpayers an awful lot of money. This is why tokenization is the big thing in crypto right now and how it's leading to the next big thing of the metaverse, which John alluded to as well. The work you're doing is extraordinarily exciting. It's going to be noticed by consumers in coming years, and it's going to be massively improving our lives. And I'm really excited to see that you're at the forefront of this, John. Thank you very much. And with the success, the early success of our healthcare platform, we have, uh, we're working right now on plans in multiple large addressable market industries, including real estate, finance, and some others. But it's a very exciting time 
to be in the business. There are tremendous opportunities which will create enormous value and very important to us in tokenology, make a positive difference in people's lives. And we're going to leverage the technology to do that. That's what we're committed to. Uh, it's fascinating conversation, and we'll be watching uh, your work over time, and I'm sure I'll have you back. Uh, that's John Weiser, the co-founder and CEO of Tokenology Labs. You can learn more about the work that they're doing at tokenologylabs.com. You're listening to The Truth About Your Future. I'm Rick Edelman. Very happy to tell you, if you missed the news so far, that starting in January, this weekly radio show is going to become a daily podcast. Same content, same great guests and interviews, and I invite you to listen to the daily podcast, and you can subscribe to it right now. Just go wherever you get your podcasts, iTunes, Spotify, Apple, Google, and of course, my website, thetruthayf.com, giving you all the information you've grown to love that I present to you every week for the past 32 years. I'll continue doing that for you, but starting in January as a podcast, my new podcast, it's free. The Truth About Your Future with Rick Edelman. The Truth About Your Future is sponsored by Global X ETFs. You tune in every week to hear Rick Edelman tackle the personal finance topics that matter most to investors. And this year, what matters most is market volatility, stubbornly high inflation, and rising interest rates. It's been a lot to grapple with. At Global X ETFs, our income oriented strategies can be an appealing way to help you position your portfolio during this period of uncertainty and volatility. Our approach goes beyond bonds and traditional fixed income investments. We focus instead on asset classes that offer you income-producing potential that you may not have considered, including MLPs from the energy sector, real estate investment trusts, preferred stocks, covered call strategies, and dividend-paying stocks. We've been providing investors like you with income-oriented investments like these for more than a decade through both bull and bear markets. Come explore our full range of ETFs and look at our research and more at GlobalXETFs.com or talk with your financial advisor. Global X ETFs. The Truth About Your Future with Rick Edelman is sponsored by Charles Schwab. Schwab's passion for serving clients is more than standard practice. It's part of who they are. With transparent pricing, 24-7 live support, and a satisfaction guarantee, the people at Schwab go the extra mile to help you on your investing journey. They're not just financial people. They're people people, too. Learn more at schwab.com slash schwab. That's schwab.com slash schwab. You're listening to The Truth About Your Future with Rick Edelman, sponsored by Choice. If you want more control over how you invest your money, you need to check out Choice. Choice makes it easy for you to invest in Bitcoin and other crypto assets in your retirement account. You can transfer your existing IRA, roll over an old 401k, or start fresh with a new investment. There are no hidden fees or account minimums, just more choice in how you invest your money. You can open a deductible or Roth IRA and invest in Bitcoin, crypto, stocks, ETFs, gold, real estate, and more, all in a single account. Don't let your old bank or brokerage firm limit what you're allowed to invest in. Do what Rick did and take control of your future by heading on over to retirewithchoice.com slash Rick. That's retirewithchoice.com slash Rick. Or simply search Choice IRA in the App Store or Google Play Store on your iPhone or Android device. It's your money. It should be your choice. Retirewithchoice.com slash Rick. You're listening to The Truth About Your Future. You know, we've been spending an awful lot of time talking about the stock market and the bond market and the crypto market. I mean, everybody's fixated on all of the things going on in the economy. But one subject that is getting, I think, a bit of short shrift is the real estate market. What's going on there? Well, let's talk about it. And to help us do that, I'm happy to bring on to the program Chase Bolding. He's the Portfolio Manager and Chief Investment Officer of the Invesco Real Estate Income Trust. Chase, great to have you on the show. Thanks, Rick. Good to be with you. So this is one of the most uh, significant investments in the real estate world, the Invesco Real Estate Income Trust, known as INREIT owns more than a billion dollars worth of real estate throughout the country. So, Chase, I'll just start right there. This might be a dumb question, but let's just put it on the table. How are inflation and interest rates affecting the real estate market today? 
Yeah, that that is clearly the question on on the top of everyone's minds. And and to answer it for private commercial real estate, which I'll distinguish from public real estate in a little bit, um, I think you have to break it into two components. Number one is from a capital markets perspective, what return and risk are investors willing to tolerate and do they want to achieve on commercial real estate um, investments? And then number two um, is more about the fundamentals driving the demand for real estate, not from an investor standpoint, but when you think about the actual users of space, be it individuals or companies, right? So the inflation question is really primarily related to the first component there, which is what's the level of risk and return that investors want? And what's happening in the private real estate space is that the market is digesting a higher risk-free rate, a higher, a much higher cost of financing that we use to acquire assets. And the result is a fairly large difference between what sellers are willing to accept and what buyers are wanting to pay. So that bid ask has uh, created a little bit of a lull in transaction activity as everyone digests. And it's certainly understandable because everybody knows what your house was worth a year ago at the top of the market when interest rates were 2%. And now that interest rates have doubled, tripled in uh, uh, size, that home seller is still taking the attitude, well, a year ago, my house was worth a million and a half dollars. So I don't want you to tell me it's only worth 1.1 right now. And they are insisting on selling the house for the same price it was worth a year ago. And of course, the real estate agent is frustrated trying to get them to come down to earth. That's a classic investor psychological mistake, isn't it? Yes, that's right. And and the good news for commercial real estate is it's not, uh, traditionally, it's not a home. Um, most homes don't produce income, certainly mine doesn't. Um, whereas commercial real estate not only produces typically um, pretty durable and growing income, um, but you value that very differently than you would something that that doesn't produce income. So income is one of the key attributes and the ability to find growing income by investing in front of demand is I think what provides some support to the asset class. And I think on the flip side, buyers are equally wrong in the sense that housing prices have come down because interest rates have gone up, but housing prices haven't gone to zero. <laughs> so when a seller come when a buyer comes along and says, "Oh, that house you're asking for 1 and a half million, I'll offer you 400 grand for it." I mean, you know, let's get serious here. That you know, housing prices are down, but they're not down that much. This isn't like 2008. So buyers need to get more realistic and raise your offer. Sellers need to get more realistic and lower your asking price. That's kind of where we're at, aren't we, with that bid ask, as you said. They will cross again and you will see a healthy, productive market. I think that's probably coming here pretty soon. And that's exactly, um, you're right, that dynamic will, will change. Now, it's understandable for homeowners to be very emotional about their properties. Uh, this house is the only house I've got. And I raised my kids in this house. I have a huge emotional attachment to this property. And it represents a very significant chunk of my net worth. So I need to get as much out of it as I can. Homeowners are emotionally engaged. And so are home buyers because they want to raise their family there. They want to move into that community. This is the only house they're going to live in, uh, at least for the next several years. So everybody on both sides of the transaction is very emotionally engaged. But I assume that in commercial real estate, that's not really the case, is it? I mean, this is just another property. You have a billion dollars worth of real estate in your portfolio. You're not falling in love with an office tower the way that you would with a house. Is there a different dynamic that goes on when you have a buyer and seller of commercial real estate doing a deal? Look, I hope so, right? I mean, I think those biases that you talk about a lot are prevalent in all investing. I mean, that's kind of what makes a market in some ways, um, but certainly at Invesco Real Estate and with, with this REIT in particular, uh, we try to separate uh, the emotion from, um, from the math and, and the facts at hand. Um, so what we like to say is you know, we don't fall in love with our real estate. We value our real estate every month. And if someone thinks it's worth more than we do and they have the money to buy it, um, 
they're 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 welcome to to have it as long as we have something equally as interesting to do with that with that capital. So I think being very cognizant that those biases exist, um, trying not to fall victim to them yourself, and that's the endowment bias you're talking about. Just because I own it doesn't make it worth more. I think leads to better outcomes for investors. Give us a a, a broad. Um understanding of the kinds of properties that are in the uh, INREIT uh, fund, the Invesco Real Estate Investment uh, Income Fund. What are the kind of properties that you own? We are focused on the types of commercial real estate that we believe are benefiting from secular long-term demand drivers. Um, So for us, broadly, that falls into various forms of rental housing, aspects of the supply chain, such as industrial warehouses, and then healthcare. Um, If you think about what's happening in this country, um, and and true, I think, globally as well, look, people need a place to live. And there are various flavors of rental housing with diverse, durable demand drivers that uh, make sense for an income-focused vehicle. So we think that's a mainstay component of what we do. Uh, demographically speaking, we are aging as a population. We're spending an increasing amount of money, unfortunately, on healthcare, And I don't think that goes down anytime soon, even though there's a lot of innovation and tech trying to do so. So we need, and increasingly that healthcare is happening away from a hospital. So that's happening in, in physical real estate that's owned by people like us. Um, there's also the development of, of, of healthcare and medicines and the life sciences and the lab space. So we believe in these places uh, and these sectors long-term. And then I mentioned warehouses, the secular demand for consumption moving to more of an e-commerce wrapper is uh, well-established. COVID pulled forward a lot of the demand. And I think that 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 trend continues. And and now with the geopolitical landscape, there's a, I think there's a further case to be made uh, via onshoring, that a lot of these aspects of the supply chain that were located outside of the U.S. perhaps make more sense here domestically. So um, housing, healthcare, the supply chain, these are sectors that we believe will appreciate long-term and provide durable income uh, throughout the inevitable market cycles. Well, it's interesting you mentioned healthcare. Um, so, are you referring to buying the buildings that a hospital will occupy, a rehab facility, a nursing home, a laboratory that is engaging in scientific research in healthcare? Is that what you're referring to when you refer to healthcare relative to real estate? We do that. We do all of those things. So, we're invested in the big lab and life science as a firm. Investor Real Estate is invested in, heavily invested in. Uh, the biotech and lab sectors in those big nodes in um, Southern California, around San Diego, obviously around Boston, you're seeing it sprout up uh, throughout the rest of the country selectively, but those are still kind of the dominant places for that. Um, So we're big investors there as a firm. And then in the REIT in particular, we own a large portfolio of medical office buildings located in growing states like Texas and in Florida, where the provision of healthcare being increasingly away from the hospital, the demand for outpatient care, um, and particularly up the acuity spectrum, um, we think is a is a smart place to invest. So it's interesting that you mentioned this. I would almost call it uh, the uh, cottage industry approach to investing. In other words, I might love the idea of Amazon. Uh, it, but on the other hand, instead of buying Amazon stock, I can invest in real estate that prov- serves as a warehouse for the distribution of the products that Amazon sells. So it allows me to invest riding the coattails of Amazon's success, but in a brick and mortar environment without having to you know, ride the volatility wave of Amazon stock itself. Does that make sense? It makes sense. I mean, I think you're hitting on something very important about owning private assets and private real estate in your portfolios, it is a real diversifier. So there's income benefits, there's some tax benefits associated with the income from real estate investment trusts or REITs. Um, But the diversification is a real component um, and an argument for the asset class. The the performance tends to be um, low or, or not correlated at all 
to what's happening in the in the public markets that that bears out uh, historically and then in times of inflation as we sit here today the asset class does very well uh traditionally as you can pass through uh higher rates to the occupiers of your space so we think having an allocation to private assets look it's been something that institutional investors have been doing for decades and as we sit today 10 to 20 percent of the average institutional investor pension endowment sovereign wealth fund etc uh 10 to 20 percent of their portfolios is in private real estate and private 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 assets uh because they see the benefit and we think it's time that individual investors enjoy some of that as well maybe not to the same maybe not to the same degree but some of that and part of the problem historically with individual investors buying real estate is that real estate is expensive. You know, it's easy to buy a share of a stock for $5, but it's hard to buy a piece of real estate that costs hundreds of thousands or millions, or in the case of commercial buildings, they can cost billions of dollars. And they're illiquid. You can't easily sell the New York Empire State Building. Um, so that's why institutional investors have been the buyers of this stuff. And retail investors have been largely shut out until funds like yours have come along that kind of democratize and demonetize the asset class. You make it much more affordable for people to invest in the fund, and you provide much greater diversification by owning dozens, hundreds, thousands of properties in the portfolio as opposed to just one apartment building. Uh, and so it makes it more accessible to ordinary investors. And that's something that didn't exist 10 or 15 or 20 years ago. And today it demonstrates that Retail investors who have not been paying attention to real estate really ought to start paying attention to it because there are investment opportunities that never existed before. Is that fair to say? I think it's very fair to say. Some of those features you you just spoke of with respect to um, accessibility, transparency, and what's being done inside these portfolios and, and why, um, getting some liquidity along the way. These, these REITs are traditionally... Um, open-ended. So to the extent you want your capital back, that is available uh, each month up to up to a cap. And I think just having fee reduction is a, is a reality across most investment products and uh, REITs and, and private REITs such as ours are no exception to that. So I just think for, for a host of reasons, these vehicles um, have really improved for the benefit of the individual investor and, and will continue to do so. So I think most folks, whether they've ever invested in real estate or not, understand the benefits of real estate investing, meaning uh, if I rent out a property, I'm going to get rental income. And over time, that property ought to rise in value. This is why a lot of folks like to buy beach property or mountain property. You know, they never live in it. They just use it as rental. They'll buy, you know, a, a townhouse uh, somewhere and generate rental income from it. But are there... Um, other benefits beyond the rental income, the growth in value? Is there any other benefit economically to the real estate sector that people might not be really familiar with? I think for sure. I mean, I think it starts with, with income. It's, it starts with income durability. In, in the inevitable market cycles like we're in um, now, and you've seen it in the, in the public markets, having that reliable stream of cash flows and ideally growing with inflation and otherwise, is very important for individual investors. You layer on top of that uh, the tax benefits that come from the REIT structure. And I don't want to get too wonky here, but but you can largely treat the dividend as a return of capital as, a, as opposed to a return on capital. And that's, that's beneficial. Um, so you have income, you have tax benefits. You have the diversification benefits that we just spoke about when added to a traditional portfolio of stocks and bonds. Um, and then maybe over the top of that right now would be the inflationary benefits of being in being in real estate um, and in the private markets where you can pass through price increases to the occupiers, corporations like Invesco and individuals um, that is hard to find elsewhere. You had mentioned diversification as one of the benefits uh, of investing in a fund like uh, the one you manage at Invesco. Uh, and we know that different kinds of real estate represents different opportunities for diversification. There's individual homes. In your fund, you've got warehouses. You've got 
the healthcare sector, uh, and you're also diversifying geographically. You know, there's a very big difference between California and Vermont. Um, so you're providing diversification by geography as well as type of property. But you also alluded earlier, Chase, to the difference between public real estate versus private real estate. Explain the difference between those two. Sure. So in the the public REIT market, you would see um, those companies own one sector, right? So you have an apartment REIT, you have an office REIT, you have a hotel REIT. Generally speaking, there are not diversified REITs. So to create diversification in the public markets, you would need to buy a basket or um, you know a handful of public REITs according to your views on sector, right? So there, there's one key difference there because when you invest in our REIT and our funds, you are getting that diversification in one place. Um, the other, I would say, most, most glaring difference would be uh, the volatility. It, the, the public REIT market tends to be fairly correlated or in sync with what public equities are doing at large, right? So the REIT, um, the REIT indices, very highly correlated with S&P 500. Uh, you look at the private markets, that correlation is extremely low. So there's traditionally, there's been higher income. Um, you get lower correlation. So there's your diversification uh, benefits in a portfolio. Um, and then once you actually peel back and look at what's actually in these REITs, you're going to see greater diversification than you would buying a single public REIT dedicated to one sector. So what we need to make sure everybody understands is that we're talking about real estate investment trusts. These are what I refer to, this is inaccurate, but that's the way I refer to it, as the mutual funds of the real estate marketplace. Um, so instead of buying a single piece of real estate, you buy a fund that buys a variety of real estate for diversification. Most of these REITs, these real estate investment trusts, are public, meaning they're publicly traded. Um, they're liquid. They trade like stocks. You can buy them and sell them whenever you feel like it. And that brings volatility because the prices fluctuate daily on a daily basis. The private real estate market is also known as a non-traded REIT, meaning once you invest in it, your money's locked up for how many years, Chase? Well, it's technically not locked up. Um, we hope that investors think about an investment or allocation to the REIT in a very long-term way, because that's how we think about those demand drivers that I mentioned earlier and the performance of our assets. When we buy a building or a collection of buildings, we think about the performance and we project the performance of that asset over three, five, seven, ten 10 years. So we hope that investors invest with that same time horizon in mind. However, we get it. Things happen. Um, health. Otherwise, you need access to your capital. And that's why most of these non-traded REITs today do offer liquidity on a monthly basis to the individual investor. And to be clear about the public space, just one more point on that, Rick, is look, at Invesco Real Estate, we're big believers in the public REIT market. I mean, we have a very large 15 billion or more public REIT business where we buy common stock, and we buy credit. And, and we think that makes sense. I just want to be clear that that public REIT sector will tend to act like the other public equities in someone's portfolio. Whereas on the private side, uh, for all the reasons we're talking about, you're going to see differences with respect to income and volatility. And is there a difference as well between a publicly traded REIT versus a private REIT in terms of the uh, investment minimum? Yes, there is. I mean, as you know, you can buy. So in our fund, it's a $2,500 minimum. I think the average investor would be, you know, multiples of that, but it is accessible for $2,500, which, uh, you know, I would think most of your listeners um, could do. Uh, in the public space, you know, you can buy a share of stock for for much, for much less. So it just depends on, on what you're trying to do there. But having institutional caliber, large scale portfolios accessible for $2,500, you know, we think and hope is, a, is an attractive proposition. We're talking with Chase Bolding. He's the portfolio manager and chief investment officer of the Invesco Real Estate Income Trust. What would you say, Chase, is the most interesting 
of the real estate sectors that most investors wouldn't think of? So there are a number of answers to that question. It's a great question. Uh, Historically, people have thought about commercial real estate in four main food groups. You have an office building, you have a retail property, maybe it's a mall, maybe it's a strip center. You have an apartment building and you have an industrial building. And that's how most institutional investors allocated to the asset class. Well, the asset class has evolved in a major way. And if you think about it, it it goes so far beyond those four property types. I mean, it is truly where we as people and companies consume, live, innovate, and connect with one another. It houses the economy. So you're seeing things like studio space for content creation, which is obviously very popular right now. Um, You have it in self-storage properties right? Because people need a place to store things and they can't always do it uh, in their homes, particularly with those homes costing more and more, uh, more and more money. Um, You see it in the healthcare space, which we've talked about. People need a place to receive healthcare. And increasingly that's outside of a hospital. So that creates demand for real estate. The other one uh, that I think is very interesting is in the single family home market. You've mentioned it several times. That is where most investors have um, the majority of their equity today. Um, and for um, really forever, the single family home market has been highly fragmented, uh, not owned by institutional investors. But increasingly, you are seeing groups like us take a harder look at that sector as a real value proposition for people uh, to get the experience of owning a home, but without the down payment. That, that comes with it. And maybe they can age and grow into that down payment in that home. Um, but with multifamily or, or apartment rents, you know, ticking up, we know what home prices have done, not to mention the cost of a mortgage. So that payment has gone up a lot for most people. There's a place right in the middle for renting a single family home that is becoming more institutionalized. And we think it's a very um, elegant investment option for an income-oriented investor. Well, I think what you've demonstrated for us is that there's a wide array of investment opportunities in the world of real estate, just on par with the wide array of investment opportunities in the stock market. And rather than trying to become an expert in all of that, better for us to hire a fund manager who spends their full-time career figuring out what those investment opportunities are, packaging them for us in one convenient investment offering so that our life is a lot simpler and easier to deal with. And yet we get the exposure to a diversified real estate position within our portfolio that we would otherwise lack. So I would encourage you to take a serious look at the Invesco Real Estate Income Trust and the other real estate investment trusts that Invesco offers. You can learn about them from your financial advisor or by visiting Invesco's website at Invesco.com. That's Chase Bolding, the portfolio manager of Invesco's Real Estate Income Trust. Chase, thanks so much for joining us on the show. Thanks, Rick. Enjoy the conversation us to introduce you to Sabrina, an ordinary person who helped shape the future by putting her money behind the right ideas. Each morning, Sabrina enjoys a 20-mile bike ride and meditation that brings her serenity for the day to come. Sabrina is also accessing the companies that are revolutionizing the tech world by investing in Invesco QQQ. Invesco QQQ is a fund that allows you access to innovators of the NASDAQ 100, which goes to show you don't have to be an integrated circuit engineer to help push progress forward. Become an agent of innovation. Learn more at Invesco.com slash QQQ. There are risks when investing in ETFs, including possible loss of money. ETFs risks are similar to those of stocks. Investments in the tech sector are subject to greater risk and more volatility than more diversified investments. The NASDAQ 100 index comprises the 100 largest non-financial companies on the NASDAQ. You can't invest directly into an index. Before investing, consider the fund's investment objectives, risks, charges, and expenses. Visit Invesco.com for a prospectus with this information. Read it carefully before investing investing. Afraid to look at your financial statements? Shredding them without opening them? It's time for a second opinion from Edelman Financial Engines. Our opinions aren't based on intuition or daily market movements. They're grounded in institutional rigor, and all of our planners are fiduciaries who put your interest above all others. So if you need help managing the ups and downs of this market, we're ready to talk. 
At Edelman Financial Engines, you get personalized investment recommendations from a dedicated wealth planner who doesn't sell products to earn commissions. So stop shredding those financial statements. Let's take a look together. It's time to get a second opinion. Get your complimentary wealth checkup where you can discuss your financial goals with a wealth planner. Call Edelman Financial Engines at 888-899-4450. That's 888-899-4450. Or visit planefe.com slash rick today. The Truth About Your Future is sponsored by Global X ETFs. You tune in every week to hear Rick Edelman tackle the personal finance topics that matter most to investors. And this year, what matters most is market volatility, stubbornly high inflation, and rising interest rates. It's been a lot to grapple with. At Global X ETFs, our income-oriented strategies can be an appealing way to help you position your portfolio during this period of uncertainty and volatility. Our approach goes beyond bonds and traditional fixed income investments. We focus instead on asset classes that offer you income-producing potential that you may not have considered, including MLPs from the energy sector, real estate investment trusts, preferred stocks, covered call strategies, and dividend-paying stocks. We've been providing investors like you with income-oriented investments like these for more than a decade through both bull and bear markets. Come explore our full range of ETFs and look at our research and more at GlobalXETFs.com or talk with your financial advisor. Global X ETFs. You're listening to The Truth About Your Future. You know, we're going to live a nice, long, healthy age. Healthy, right? Well, I want to help you figure out how to do exactly that, because if you're going to live into your 70s, 80s, 90s, 100s, you want to make sure that you're healthy for as much of it as you possibly can. We have long and long lifespans, but we don't tend to have a very long health span. We tend to live the last 12 years of our lives in a state of declining health, and that's not really what we want to do. We want to be super healthy all the way up to the day we die, right? Well, let me share with you the story of Charlotte Sandal. Charlotte has a workout routine. I want to share it with you because it's something you might want to consider emulating. Charlotte starts the day with a plank pose for one minute. She then does a wall sit for one minute. She does that twice a day. She goes to a health club three times a week. She uses the leg press and the chest press. And she swims four times a week, typically a half mile each day. She does all four strokes. And she says, if I do too much, I'm wiped out. I need to come home and take a nap. She walks around her block twice a day, and she uses walking poles, which makes it easier and also provides upper body strength. She stretches every day, does yoga twice a week. She drinks protein shakes with chia and flax seeds. Supper, usually a salad. And some wine, which she loves. She also loves chocolate milkshakes and hot fudge sundaes. Why am I talking about Charlotte? I mean, that workout regimen doesn't sound all that extreme, does it? It certainly sounds like something you too could do, especially the chocolate milkshakes. Charlotte has competed in 400 swimming races. She holds five world records, 10 swimming records, and she's been in the top 10 300 times, and she's currently training for the 2023 World Championships that are going to be held in Japan. And Charlotte, in case I forgot to mention it, is 100 years old. I'm Rick Edelman. This is the truth about your future. Hey, I'm happy to tell you that the Edelman Planetarium has just uh, released the data on the 2021 uh, school year that ended uh, in May. Um, we're really excited about the planetarium. It is the only planetarium in South Jersey, and it draws school children from all over the Delaware Valley. Of course, during the pandemic, the planetarium had to close, but it's now reopened and fully operational. 162 school field trips this past academic year, with 1,500 school teachers and 5,000 students going through programs. They did 341 shows, reaching a total audience of over 15,000 people, including a lot of college students and, and folks who live in uh, the South Jersey and Philadelphia, Delaware community. 
If you live in the Delaware Valley, I encourage you to go to Rowan University and check out the Edelman Planetarium. Jean and I provided the funding for this facility to bring state-of-the-art planetarium technology to school children. There's no better way to get kids excited about science than letting them look at the stars. Oh, except for maybe digging for dinosaurs. That's the Edelman Fossil Park at Rowan University. And that's a whole nother conversation. Oh, and Rowan University is now the third fastest growing public research university in the country, according to the Chronicle of Higher Education. Enrollment at the university is up 74% over the past 10 years. They now attract 23,000 students uh, a year. So we're really excited that our old alma mater is doing just fine. Thank you very much. Time now for everybody's favorite segment of the program, a visit by my wife, Jean Edelman. Jean, a student of the healing arts, Reiki, traditional Chinese medicine, homeopathy, acupuncture, and of course, macrobiotic and plant-based cooking. Here's Jean. Wonderful to be with you this week. This week, a prayer keeps coming to mind. It's called the Serenity Prayer. It goes like this. Grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. I think we all pray, and our prayers can be simple as simple as, thank you for that parking spot, or thanks for all the green lights. Prayers are a moment of gratitude in our daily life, and it doesn't matter how big or small. This prayer especially gives us perspective because we do need the wisdom when we are having some difficult times. And we do need the wisdom to know when do we engage and when do we remove ourselves from the situation. And so our action item for this week is thinking about, is there a person or a situation that we're trying to change? Let's write down the issue. And then let's tear up the paper because we need to think about letting it go. We need to decide, are we going to accept it or are we going to continue fighting? But it's easier and less energy and less emotional stress if we just accept it. We can have realistic expectations or we can have no expectations at all. And we need to remember that the only amount of life that we can predict, change, and affect is about three feet around us, our own little bubble, because we need to change us. We need to change how we are acting, reacting, and interacting with others. And so I think a big piece of this prayer is practicing acceptance. And so simply, my word this week is accept. The A is for allow. People are people. We really can't change them. We can only change how we react to them. And the C is for care. We need to care about ourselves. We need to make sure that we are not extending time and energy. It's easier to walk away, even if we're walking away frustrated, because then we are preserving ourselves and caring for ourselves. The other C is for calm, peaceful. This is what we need around us. The E is to enjoy. We can enjoy life better when we are in the flow with it. And, we're tr and when we are trying to be the rock in the stream that's holding the water back because we don't want that, well, after a while, we'll only get worn down. And so we need to stop being that rock and be the river or the stream and go with the flow. The P is for patience. This takes a lot of patience. We need to have patience with ourselves and patience with others. 
we really haven't walked in someone else's shoes and we really don't know what they're going through. So it takes patience and kindness. The T is for teach. There are so many teaching moments in our life. There's opportunities to share and talk. And when we share and talk, these our gifts of wisdom can be given to others. Accept. It's a beautiful prayer. The courage to change the things we can and the wisdom to know the difference. Remember, if we're not caring for ourselves, we can't care for others. Have a beautiful week, everyone. I know you can't get enough of Gene. Well, you can go to the truthayf.com for more of Gene's words of the week. Did you know Schwab offers a satisfaction guarantee? If for any reason you're not completely satisfied, Schwab will refund your fee or commission and work with you to make things right. You won't find that kind of promise everywhere, but you will find it at Schwab. It's just another way that they put clients' interest at the heart of everything they do. Learn what's included and how it works at schwab.com slash satisfaction. That's schwab.com slash satisfaction. You're listening to The Truth About Your Future with Rick Edelman. Thanks for listening to today's show. And thanks to Bitwise Asset Management for being our sponsor. Rick asked Bitwise to support the show because Bitwise has just one mission, to help you understand and access the opportunities in crypto. As crypto continues to grow in scale and complexity, a trusted guide is more important than ever. That's why Bitwise has built a nationwide team of crypto experts to help you. So take advantage of Bitwise's team. They work closely with financial advisors, institutions, and individual investors just like you. Talk to a Bitwise expert today or sharpen your crypto knowledge with Bitwise's awesome library of content. You'll find great help, whether you're a crypto beginner or a financial professional. Crypto has major risks to consider, including the loss of your entire investment. So before investing in crypto funds, visit bitwiseinvestments.com for their library of content and to learn about the risks with these investments. That's bitwiseinvestments.com. Well, that's all the time we've got on The Truth About Your Future this weekend. Remember, sign up for my new master class, Financial Planning in the Age of Longevity. It's free at thetruthayf.com. That's the truth. AYF.com. See you next week. The truth about your future with Rick Edelman has been brought to you by Global X ETFs, dedicated to providing investors with unexplored and intelligent solutions. And by Bitwise, a trusted guide in crypto has never mattered more. Connect with their dedicated team of crypto experts nationwide at bitwiseinvestments.com. And by Invesco QQQ, a fund that allows you to access the innovators of the NASDAQ 100. Invesco.com. Stay tuned for Everyday Wealth with Soledad O'Brien and Gene Chatsky from Edelman Financial Engines. EverydayWealth.com backslash radio. EFE and the truth about your future with Rick Edelman are unaffiliated entities. Get the truth about your future every weekend with Rick Edelman. It's the truth, AYF.com.